Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Festival. This is a session about organoids and transplantation. I'm Richard Westcott. I'm a BBC science correspondent and I have done this story a few times, but I am by no means an expert, which is why we've got three people who can bring so much to this uh, discussion, all from different angles. So let me introduce them. We've got Dr. Emma Rawlins, who's from the Gurdon Institute at the University of Cambridge. She's building organoid lungs to try to work out how all the different cells grow and interact. And why is she doing that? Because it allows her lab to model disease and could one day help us repair damaged lungs. And then we've got Karosh Saeed Parsi, who's a transplant surgeon and research scientist at the University of Cambridge. And he's looking at using organoids to grow and replace damaged cells in organs. And why is that so key? Well, it's so you don't have to replace the entire organ and that could make the treatment much quicker and much safer in future, not so many transplants maybe. And then we've got Nick Hopwood, who's Professor of History and Science and Medicine at Cambridge University. Uh, and he'll be giving us insights into the medical history behind organoids and transplants and mapping out all those different steps that have brought us to where we are today. So hello to all of you. And I think the, the, the basic upshot is, guys, is that if, if you can explain it and I can understand it, that's about the right level, okay? Because I'm not a medical person, but this is all such fascinating stuff. But don't worry if you don't really know what an organoid is or what you use them for and so on, because that's what we're going to start with, very simple explanations. And then each of the three are going to give a, a longer talk about their work. And then after that, I'll ask some questions about uh, what they do. But first of all, Emma, can we start with you? And let's start with the absolute basic. What is an organoid? Sure, very happy to. So to really appreciate why all of us are so excited about the organoids, you've got to understand what we've been working with previously. So previously, most work using cells in the lab was in cells that are grown in 2D, growing flat on a Petri dish, that we called immortalized cell lines, the so cell lines that just grew forever. And the trouble with them is that they lose the characteristics of the tissue they came from. So if you get cells from the skin or you get cells from your lungs, they end up looking like a generic cell. And the special thing about organoids is that now we grow the cells in three dimensional conditions and they retain the features of the organ they came from. Brilliant. Um, and the answers, so many questions open up in my mind about whether they're actually mini organs or some, but we are going to come on to all of that later. And specifically, I don't know if people might have seen those organoid brains. I have a lot of questions about those. But, but first of all, Karosh, can you explain, okay, we've got these organoids, how can we use them? Because there's lots of different potential uses, aren't there? Great. Thank you, Richard. Yes, as Emma explained, these um, organoids are very special because they really do look like the original cells that they came from. So they actually replicate the biology of the cells um, that they were derived from. What this means is that we can generate essentially unlimited amount of these cells. So we have unlimited amount of cells which resemble the original tissue and we can use them to repair or replace um, parts of the uh, organs that are diseased or damaged. If these organoids come from diseased cells and diseased tissues such as cancerous tissue, they actually recapitulate again that disease process, which means we can use them to study mechanisms of disease and to test the effectiveness of drugs. And Nick, you are a, a medical historian effectively. These things don't come out of the blue, do they? There's a sort of big lead up to them. What is the history of organoids? I mean, today, organoids tend to be associated with making these three-dimensional tissues like uh, little guts or so-called mini brains from stem cells. Over the last 170 years or so, the terms meant various different things, but usually it's been about something that resembles an organ. And it's been used most importantly for small growths of cells or tissues in culture and for artificial organs. Now, this cell culture began in the early 20th century when scientists also started to show in animals that if they took cells from a tissue and separated them, then those cells could reassemble into similar patterns as in the original tissue. By the 1970s, biologists were growing cells in special 3D gels to produce organ-like structures. For example, they could coax fragments of animal gland into reproducing the branching structure. 
And that longer history matters, I think, because culturing stem cells and all the amazing things that are being done with them in the 21st century have relied on that earlier work. Um, they've relied technically uh, as the main source of the methods of 3D culture, in including those gels, and more conceptually for the insight that cells can self-organize, but the environments of the cells shape how they develop. Fantastic. Right. Well, we're now going to uh, go into a little bit more detail about all of your work. You're going to give a little presentation. And then after that, we'll start opening up and hopefully have a discussion about you know, what's happening now, but also where this all goes in the future. Uh, for the first presentation, we're going back to you, Nick. Thank, thanks, Richard. So the latest research on organoids was made possible by work in several fields that goes back through the 20th century and even into the 19th. One strand is that tradition of cell and organ culture that I was just talking about. And there's also history of transplantation of, of organs and of cells, including the bone marrow stem cells that make blood cells. The other main context is research on embryos, and that's what I'd like to introduce now. Embryology aims to understand how complex bodies develop from simpler beginnings. Humans are especially curious about our own. But human embryology presents a huge challenge because our development is hidden inside pregnant bodies. Scientists have taken two main approaches to meeting that challenge. The main one is to study more accessible species as substitutes or surrogates, especially frogs, chicks and domestic mammals. But there's also a long tradition among anatomists of collecting the human material that they could find and doing what they could with it. From the end of the 18th century, doctors collected from encounters, mainly with aborting and miscarrying women. They took clumps in blood, which they dissected, drew and modeled. So I hope you can see here, I'm, I'm showing a particularly important series of uh, printed drawings of human embryos from near the end of the 19th century and uh, models that form part of this same publication. Now, both approaches were tricky. Uh, how confident could the embryologists be that humans were like other animals? How could they produce a picture of normal development from material that might have been miscarried because it wasn't normal? Not all of these embryos that we're looking at now would be seen as normal today, but by the end of the 19th century, embryologists had a fairly connected account of human development, except for the first two weeks. For the earliest stages, they still relied on surrogates. Some scientists argued that shared evolution meant that all backboned animals started very similar anyway. But the scientists who founded modern human embryology around 1900 refused to assume similarity. They insisted on studying humans uh, in our own right. From the early 20th century, gynecological operations gave access to earlier and better material. Specimens through the first two weeks were retrieved by a project in the United States between the 1930s and the 1950s. This was based at the Free Hospital for Women in Boston. It's sometimes called the Boston Egg Hunt, which arranged clinically indicated hysterectomies, so operations that remove the uterus at known times after menstruation and intercourse. That was ethically delicate then and would, of course, be unethical today. But it increased the chance of finding something. And by around 1950, they had elaborate descriptions right through development. So here's a plaster model, which we're seeing in four views that's been built up from uh, highly magnified slices, showing you just to give a sense of the detail that they already had. It's a stage 10 embryo. They also set up what would become and is still the standard staging system for arranging uh, embryos in developmental order. Now, this sort of descriptive research went out of fashion during the 1940s. Instead, developmental biologists did experiments. They did cellular and molecular studies as basic science and because it was relevant to understanding cancer. That was impossible on humans, so they used so-called model organisms, especially mice. Mice have been engineered for genetic research, 
And by the 1960s, their early embryos could be cultured. These researchers focused on mechanisms they assumed would be shared between mice and humans. They didn't think there was much point in studying humans directly. Now that started to change with the invention of in vitro fertilization, which led to the birth of the first so-called test tube baby in Oldham in 1978. Soon, fertility clinics were producing spare embryos, such as this eight cell embryo. After much debate, it was agreed that research could be done on these embryos under strict regulation enshrined in the Human Fertilization and Embryology Acts, up to a limit of 14 days. Now, from around 2000, having the human genome sequence made research on human embryos easier. Uh, geneticists wanted to go from studying the structure of genes to discover where they were active, which they hoped would show how development works and how it goes wrong. So they renewed the argument, now also for older embryos, that yes, they needed mice as the model, but to understand humans, they had to study human embryos. One thing they did was to set up the Human Developmental Biology Resource in Newcastle and London to supply embryos in the old way from terminations of pregnancy, but within a modern ethical framework. Around the same time, in, in 1998, human embryonic stem cell lines were derived from spare IVF embryos. Then it was shown that you could also derive stem cells from ordinary adult cells. There was a great deal of hype about regenerative medicine, and there are some sloppy and unscrupulous operators, but being able to generate and culture stem cells has opened up real opportunities. And this is where the new organoids come out of. Not just producing various kinds of cells from stem cells in a disorganized way on the bottom of a dish like here, but finding uh, three-dimensional culture conditions in which cells would do what, in a sense, they want to do to make an embryo or an organ. And the starting material could be embryonic stem cell lines, induced stem cells, or stem cells taken directly from embryos or adults. And it turned out that those cells like not just certain molecular signals, but for example, also the gels, like I talked about before, to mimic the environment around them, or plastic micro-engineered to impose spatial constraints. This led to the organoids that Karosh and Emma are going to talk about, and also to what are sometimes called embryoids or embryo-like structures. Embryoids don't mimic just one organ, but to some extent model the whole embryo at stages that are earlier than organs form, but later than in vitro culture is allowed. So in a way, organoids and embryoids take us back to surrogates, only now they're not just other species, especially mice, they're also in vitro systems that use human cells to model aspects of human development. But there's still the question, how do you know this is a reliable model? I expect that's something that Emma and Karosh will address. And that's certainly my cue to hand over to Emma. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Nick. Actually, some beautiful images there there as well and that's your area of expertise is those kind of medical images as well so we'll, we'll talk about those a bit more later on as well but Emma like Nick says over to you. Okay thank you Richard. So I'm working at the Gurdon Institute in Cambridge and I'm going to tell you about how a my lab uses human embryonic lung organoids to study development. So we're interested in lung development and that really means the period of embryonic lung development where our lungs are built in the embryo. So of course, this is a fascinating and interesting question, and we're a curious species. But also, we care about this because we think our work has implications for medical research. And we're primarily funded by the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust, both of whom fund medically related projects. So what sort of questions do we think our work on human lung development will address? Well, we're very interested in improving cellular systems for use in the lab for disease modeling and ultimately for drug discovery. We also care a lot about adult lung regeneration. So I'm sure many of you have heard of different degenerative adult lung disease, maybe lung fibrosis, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or especially at the moment, long COVID syndrome. So these are all diseases where our lungs are damaged and they cannot rebuild themselves. So we ask the question, 
Can we learn things from embryonic lung development that will allow us to reactivate development to restore lung function in these extremely damaged adult lungs? And finally, we're also very interested in the lab in lung cancer. Nick has already mentioned that developmental mechanisms we think are often adopted by lung cancers. Can we study the cancers and the developmental mechanisms side by side in order to improve the cancer treatment? So historically, my lab and the whole field have all worked on mouse development, mouse models of human disease. But more recently, with the advent of lots of new technologies, including organoids, my lab has switched over to working on human lung development quite specifically. So one thing we can do is access human embryonic lungs from terminations of pregnancy by the tissue bank that Nick mentioned, the Human Development Biology Resource. And we can characterize gene expression and cell types in these lungs. So one experiment we've been doing a lot recently with collaborators at the Sanger Institute, just like Cy Cambridge, is actually to explode these lungs in a controlled way into single cells and then profile gene expression. So which genes are turned on or off in each of the different cells in the lung. So this gives us a great picture of all of the different cell types in this organ. But then because we've exploded the tissue, we're missing the spatial context. So we can go back and look spatially at where our genes expressed. And doing this sort of characterization of what do the lungs look like um, really lends itself to asking all sorts of development of new hypotheses. For example, in this image, we really hypothesize that the red cells were signaling to these adjacent non-labeled cells. But how do we test that? So a few years ago, we'd have gone and we'd built a mouse model where we'd have manipulated expression of this gene. But what we can do now is actually turn to human embryonic lung organoids. So if you remember, an organoid is a cell type or group of cells grown in the lab that retain features of the organ they're derived from. And of course, we're interested in lung organoids. So just to understand how we grow our organoids, you just need to know a little bit about how the lung is built in the embryo. So in the embryo, the lung is really just a series of tubes. And what it gives rise to in the adult is tubes that the air passes up and down until it finally reaches the gas exchange region, so the biggest business end region of your lung, where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged from the blood. So both of these different structures come from the same tip epithelial cells in lung development. So when we started growing our own organoids in the lab, we wanted to know, can we grow these tip epithelial cells in the embryonic lung as an organoid? And in particular, can we grow the tip epithelial cells from human embryonic lungs so we can study human specific questions and gene, um, gene regulation networks? So to do that, we isolated the tip epithelium. We grow it in a dish in a 3D culture matrix. We provide the growth factors that the cells need. And initially we just asked, can we get these cells to form organoids at all? And you'll see what we get is initially the tips grow as little spheres and they grow like this for about seven days. And then they start to bud. So as a developmental biologist, this was tremendously exciting. So one of the key features of lung development is that the cells bud and branch. So we've captured one of those key features in our organoids. So we have budding, but the other key feature of these cells is that they become the adult airway and adult gas exchange cells. So could we make those cells in the dish? Indeed we can. So we can change the factors the cells are exposed to and get them to make either the airway epithelial cells or the gas exchange cells. So now we have a model in which we can explore and investigate all of the different um, signaling and different characteristics we've identified just from characterizing the human embryonic lungs. So how do we actually do this in practice? This is something that Nick mentioned, how do we actually use these human embryonic lung organoids for research? So we have two key things. We have our tissue maps and our characterization of the human lungs themselves. And we want to make sure that what we're studying in vitro, of course, in the dish, resembles, at least in some respects, the human embryonic lungs. We've put a lot of effort into ways of changing gene expression in our organoids. We can now do this in a very controlled fashion. So this organoid we've turned green, so that's relatively trivial. But because we worked out how to do that, we can now introduce disease associated mutations or changes in gene expression into our organoids. Something we've done very recently is mature our cells so they make 
um, gas exchange cells in the lung. So these are the gas exchange cells in the lungs are the ones that are infected by COVID-19. So you can see here our cells are expressing the COVID-19 receptor, ACE2. And really interestingly, these are embryonic or pediatric um, children's lung cells. And when we gave these cells and tried to um, infect them with a the COVID-19 virus, it was almost impossible. So our embryonic cells, our pediatric children's cells, can't be infected by COVID-19, similar to um, real children who very rarely get um, serious disease from COVID-19. So finally, what sort of projects are we doing in the lab uh, really exploring this human embryonic lung development? So we have projects based on a very simple or very complicated but fundamental cell biology of normal lung development. And actually even these turn out to be in many respects when we dig into them very disease related. We also have a project that's a collaboration with one of my colleagues at STEM Institute and also AstraZeneca, asking what signals are sufficient for maturing the gas exchange surface. And we think the results from this project were very important for lung regeneration. We look at the factors that control both your organoids and lung cancers, obviously trying to develop improved cancer treatments. And finally, we're also doing modeling of pediatric lung disease because of course, starting with an embryonic organoid, we have a fabulous source of children's lung epithelial cells. So I'm gonna stop sharing here, but I really have to acknowledge that all of this work is funded primarily by the Medical Research Council, but also the Wellcome Trust and Cancer Research UK. So back to you, Richard. Thanks, Emma. I, I love that image again of like the budding <laughs> cells. Yeah, so I'm assuming that's the first time you would ever have seen that. You couldn't see that in a, a mouse or something. Yeah, not in the same way, not like this. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, so Karosh, I guess you're, you're at the sharp end really, because you're the guy taking damaged or real organs out of people and putting them back in and looking at possible ways of doing a bit less of that in the future. So take us through your work. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Emma, for that uh, fantastic background. So uh, what I'd like to do is to um, share the story of a recent journey that we started um, in order to be able to use organoid technology to really bioengineer tissues and ultimately organs um, for use in humans. So our um, aim is to really follow a fairly um, classical path of uh, tissue generation, but perhaps with a twist of um, benefiting from uh, organoid technology. So the idea is to use cells and generate organoids, and then to seed these cells and organoids onto a, a type of scaffold, some sort of a structure, three-dimensional structure, to in the first instance generate simple bioengineered tissue. This simple bioengineered tissues would ultimately have to first be tested in small animal models, followed by large animal models and ultimately humans. But that, of course, is only really generating a simple structure. That would still be a, an order of magnitude away from generating truly entirely um, uh, complete and complex bioengineered organs. But I'd like to share that journey with you in terms of a particular liver disease that we are interested in. So the liver, uh, has many functions, but one of the things it does is that it produces bile. This bile is toxic and it's taken away from the, uh, from the liver into the gut through these tubes that are called bile ducts. If there's disease or damage to these bile ducts, this toxic bile can overflow into the liver and cause damage to the liver. This sadly affects large numbers of patients, about three to four million patients uh, at any one time. And there are different types of disease but in some of the disease, it's these large bile ducts that are really affected. And sometimes, sadly, children are born without a bile duct. If this results in really severe damage to the liver, which it often does, really the only solution is transplantation. And sadly, we know that we don't have enough organs for uh, transplanting everybody who's in need. So we've been trying to work out whether there is an alternative to liver transplantation for these patients. So we started our journey by taking cells from donors. So these were healthy cells from um, donors who um, had sadly died, but were donating their organs for transplantation. And we were able to, to take some of these cells from these uh, organ donors. And we generated our organoids. You notice that actually our organoids, at least initially, don't look dissimilar to 
what uh, MS organoids looks like. So they are really spheroids. So they are sort of um, uh, spheroids with a single layer of cell, and they're typically very small. They're probably about a tenth of a millimeter to maybe uh, uh, two or three tenths of a millimeter. So when really we talk about organoids, we're not talking about mini organs as such, but actually fairly simple structures in, in the first instance. What we were able to show was that actually we can generate unlimited quantities of these cells. And what was very exciting was that when we started to characterize these cells, we realized that actually these cells really do look very similar to those original cells that they came from. And we were able to establish this by, for example, looking for what proteins or what molecules they express on their surface. Shown in the image on the top right, the different colors really represent different proteins being expressed. And of course, we, were, we wanted to make sure that actually genetically these cells were stable. In other words, they didn't acquire mutations. And indeed, we were able to confirm that. So we now have a, an unlimited amount of cells. They're genetically stable, and they are able to function in vitro on a Petri dish. The next question is, well, do these cells survive if they are transplanted into the body? And of course, we're not at a stage that we're able to transplant these cells into a human. So that's where we go to our small animal model or mouse model. So what we did was we transplanted these cells under the kidney capsule of mice. Now you might say, well, why, why the kidney capsule? Well, that's because this is a location that has a good blood supply and you know cells that are transplanted grow well there. Again, what was really nice to see was that actually once these cells were transplanted, they actually organized themselves very nicely into little tubules or little ducts. Remember, these are supposed to be ducts. So actually without any intervention from us, they actually coordinated themselves into a network of uh, tubes. Now they look green on this picture, and that's because we've labeled them with a green uh, dye to be able to recognize them again. So now we have cells that seem to do what they should be doing, and they actually survive when transplanted into the body. The next thing was, well, can we actually bioengineer in the tissue using these cells? So we started first with a scaffold. So a scaffold is really a three-dimensional mesh of little fibers, in this case, synthetic fibers, but they can be natural fibers. And the scaffold that you see on the top left is really actually only about one millimeter by one millimeter big. So it's a very tiny scaffold. And what we did was we took our organoids and we seeded our organoids on top of the scaffold. And actually, again, uh, we were pl pleased to see that these cells proliferated. So they divided and actually really filled the scaffold. And we got a green sheet. And remember, our cells are labeled green. So we got a green sheet. So now we have a sheet, um, which is a thin sort of uh, a three dimensional structure that is seeded with our cells. So the next question again naturally is, well, what can we do with this uh, sheet of cells? We wanted to have proof of principle that we were able to use this sheet uh, of scaffold, which is seeded with our cells to really repair damage in the uh, bile duct tubes. Now, this was key because if you recall, I said that actually bile is toxic. We wanted to make sure that actually these cells would survive if they are in touch with this toxic bile. So the experiment we designed was to take the, a, a mouse under um, anesthesia and really make a little uh, cut into the gallbladder of the mouse and transplant our scaffold with our cells into the gallbladder. And actually what we were able to show that actually we were very nicely able to repair the gallbladder of these mice, that actually the cells survive and actually they perform the function, which is partly to resist the toxic effect of bile. Now, of course, we would never really want to repair somebody's gallbladder. We know we can remove a, a patient's gallbladder without problems, but this was the first proof of principle that actually in the right niche, these uh, bioengineered tissues may be functional. So the next thing we did was to say, well, can we actually replace the bile duct? This, is, this was a technically difficult exercise because of course the mouse bile duct is very tiny indeed. It's about 200 micrometers across, that's 2 tenths of a uh, millimeter. So in, col in collaboration with our engineering colleagues, we were able to generate tubes that were really that small. They were about 200 microns across. And we seeded these tubes with, with our cells. And then we cut out a tiny uh, length of the bile duct of the mice, and actually we transplanted our cells. Uh, sorry, our scaffolds into uh, where the defect was. And what you see in this image at the bottom 
uh, where it says SC, that stands for scaffold, and that's our scaffold that has been uh, transplanted. And I, you can actually see my sutures there, which are tiny, tiny sutures. We were able to show that actually these scaffolds survived in place and actually the, um, and repaired and healed very nicely. So that really gave us um, um, some uh, confidence that actually these cells would uh, be able to be used for bioengineering purposes. But of course, this is an amount, right? And the, the next question is, well, are we able now to scale this process up in order to be able to generate bile ducts that are appropriate for use for, uh, in humans? So next, naturally, we tried to make larger uh, ducts. And here um, you can see a couple of examples of tubes that we generate again in collaboration with our colleagues. And as you will see that actually these have the appropriate size that would be required for a human transplant. If you recall, I said that actually the next natural step in development of this technology is to go into a large animal models to really make sure that this, this um, strategy is safe. We were able to then transplant these bile ducts that were seeded by, uh, by our cells um, into the bile duct of pigs in a very similar experiment uh, that I mentioned with the mice, but actually replacing the bile duct of pigs. And what you can see in the red arrow is actually our um, our bile duct, which has been transplanted, and you can just see the sutures on either side. And actually, after a period of time, it heals very nicely, and it looks like a normal bile duct. So that's the stage we are. We've been able to show that we can transplant these uh, bile ducts, and actually they survive for a, a period of time. So what are the next steps? First of all, we need to be able to show that these bioengineered tissues are really truly safe to be able to be used in humans. So that means actually doing much more longer term studies to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of these bile ducts. The next challenge will be to be able to manufacture these bile ducts in a manner that is clinically suitable to be used for humans. In other words, for example, there is no risk of infections or no risk of formation of any abnormalities. And ultimately, the next stage would be to, uh, to, uh, performing human clinical trials to demonstrate that this is a useful treatment. This process is a lengthy one, um, but it is important to uh, really go through the whole um, step of development from the in vitro work that we, we started to ultimately be able to get to human clinical trials. And we hope to be there probably in the next three to five years. Thank you very much, Jaime. I'll uh, hand you back to Richard. I, it, uh, what I would like to do is to thank, uh, first and foremost, all the organ donors and families whose cells we've used for these experiments, clearly without their generosity, we would not have been able to do this. And of course, our uh, collaborators are funders. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Karosh, and thank you all actually for, for making your work so clear and easy to understand, which is, um, and it's so fascinating potentially where this is going. I'll stick with you a bit, Karosh. I, I wanna get some practical answers from you about how you would do this. You say, you know, we, we sort of, um, you know, put cells into a person. What does that mean? Do you open them up? Do you literally physically put the cells onto someone? Do you inject them? Do you see yourself ultimately making bits of organ, going in, cutting out the bit that doesn't work and putting in the new bit? How's it going to work practically? That's, that's an excellent question because, uh, you know, de demonstrating the proof of principle as we've done is one thing, but actually really making that uh, treatment available to patients is, is itself a, a very difficult logistic challenge, but also economically and in terms of manufacture and so on. So the use of these cells will depend on the particular condition we are trying to treat. So in some patients whereby we've got tiny little um, ducts that are, um, that are damaged, it may be that an injection of cells, for example, in a solution will be sufficient. And then these cells may be able to then really go to the natural place they need to be. But in other cases whereby, for example, there's a large bile duct that's damaged and it has to be replaced, that would have to be done through an operation, right? So there are the, those, those surgical aspects of it. But this would be made available to people who have no other option other than an operation anyway. So they are, they are, the option may have been, for example, liver transplantation or some other type of surgery to replace their duct. So yes, this is important that the treatment that we have to develop has to be appropriate for the particular condition that we um, have to treat. And the one thing I want to add to that is, of course, um, we need as a society to be able to actually afford to pay for these treatments, right? If we're gonna make them um, available to everybody. So we need to bear that in mind. There's really very little use to develop a technology that is so expensive that actually as a society, we can't afford to pay for it. 
One of the issues with transplantation is is rejection, isn't it? I think people have to go on drugs often for the rest of their lives, don't they? If, you, if they're not rejecting someone else's organ, does That's this right. get around that? Could you use cells from the actual person who's donating, and you know, how would that work? Absolutely. So, so certainly we, uh, uh, it is certainly possible to to be able to obtain some of these cells, um, you know, through a very minor medical procedure from a patient. So, for example, through a little biopsy or actually a um, an endoscopy, which is like a camera test where we put a camera into the into the stomach. So, it is possible to obtain these cells from a particular patient and actually then generate either cells or tissues or maybe a mini organ for that specific patient. That sounds fantastic and actually would really avoid, we believe, the, the risk of rejection. But you can imagine that actually if you've got thousands of patients, for example, just in the UK alone that need this treatment, the idea that we would do this really in a personalized manner for each patient, each patient individually was probably decades away. So probably a more realistic scenario is to generate banks of these cells whereby we've got a large number of cells and we can say, well, actually we will try and match the cells as best as we can to somebody else. And that will probably reduce the amount of immunosuppression that's required. One of the things that we're also we're interested in including in my book is to say, well, actually, can we manipulate these cells to make them less susceptible to rejection by changing the cells and molecules that they express on their surface? So again, that's probably a little while away, but that's a possibility of generating what we call universal cells. So cells that are less likely to be rejected so that they can be, if you like, available off the shelf, which is a phrase that's often used. Uh, Emma, this, I guess the image I always had in my head of organoids, I've seen that, that famous picture of little brains in a dish. And of course, everyone is immediately thinking and everyone you show the picture to says, oh, can they think, you know, can they, are we talking about long term goals of building whole human sized organs that you could put into people experiment on? Or do we not really need to do that? Is it much more about building parts of organs and watching the interactions and, and building parts of livers and all the rest of it? I think what Karosh has just really nicely illustrated is it's all a lot of it is going to be about building parts of organs. So for the mini brains that everyone sees, they're a wonderful research tool. And we have really new opportunities here to study autism spectrum disorders and other diseases that really only humans get. We can't model an animal. But nobody thinks, of course, that we can transplant those into a person or indeed that they're thinking. I think it's been much more about building the part we're interested, doing the research on it, developing drugs or potentially even developing cells for the transplant, as Karash has explained. And Nick, we've seen a lot of amazing images and pictures, and that's something you deal with a lot. How important is it to have this, these sorts of images um, to, I guess, get other people, other new scientists interested in the research, or even get the public on board, um, you know, with, with some of these ideas? Because the idea of growing an organ in a dish might, you know, really freak some people out. How important is it to see these images, to actually see it actually happening? I mean, it's become extremely important. Uh, it's one of the biggest changes in how medicine is communicated of the last 150 years with, with an acceleration, I think, even in the last few decades, um, so that we, we now expect uh, every news item really to come with its picture uh, and newspapers to reproduce those. And, and certainly in the organoids field, I mean, um, both Emma and Karosh have shown striking uh, pictures. And uh, one of the things that's helped, I think, has helped, I'd like to know what they think, but has really helped this field take off is that it's, um, its development has coincided with the availability of uh, new kinds of microscopy. Um, that that allow the um, the imaging of uh, three dimensional structures with a with a specificity, a sharpness, and picking out these these fluorescent dyes. Um, so 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 that's then really helped, and 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 certainly um, the, those cerebral organoids, those those so called mini brain uh, pictures, have have done an enormous amount to 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 convince people that that here was something amidst all the hype that perhaps was genuinely new. I think it makes very valuable points in terms of this um, 
the need and the importance of actually communicating what we do to members of the public for a whole variety of reasons. Both uh, the research that MI and I do are clearly uh, funded by public money in large part. So it's actually very important that the public are aware what it is that we are, we are doing. But actually, we also work on human tissues. So we are dependent. Our research in this progress is dependent on the generosity of, uh, of donors and families under different circumstances. So we have a sense of duty to really explain to people that actually what it is that we're doing with their precious gifts, be it in form of money and taxation, but in the, uh, in the form of tissues. And I think this, we need to ensure that uh, the public are, remain interested and supportive and enthusiastic about our research, because this is a long road. Right. While we, um, we, we, we enjoy um, little successes that we have about all of these, but actually this we are on a, on a very long road and we need to kind of maintain the momentum uh, and uh, the public and governmental support for the, for the work that we do. Yeah, Nick, coming back to you on that point, actually, obviously we're now working more on sort of human embryos and, and um, on, on humans, it was animals before. Why has it seesawed between working on animals and humans? And do you think people are more accepting now of, of working on, say, aborted humans, for example? That, that might be part of it. Um, I mean, I think there are various uh, factors that one can pick out. I mean, one is that uh, new techniques, new technical possibilities open up uh, the, the ability to work on humans. Um, and, and we've just been talking about some of those. It's also about new questions. Um, so, you know, in the late 19th century, when people were really interested in the theory of evolution, uh, let's look and see how similar uh, human embryos are to the embryos of other animals or, or how different. Um, and the early human embryologists were very keen, many of them, to highlight the differences. Um, now, uh, questions about gene expression for, for example, um, have been opened up. And so, yeah, let, let's look at, at human embryos was, was, was an important response. I think the other thing, and this does relate to what Karosh was, was just saying, is the how much pressure there is for medical payoffs. Um, if you look at the period in science after the Second World War, a period of uh, recently massively increased funding, uh, governments uh, newly funding a great deal of research and willing to say to scientists, uh, you go away and work on what you think will be interesting and useful, and we're going to trust you that, that something's going to come out of it. Now, perhaps wasn't quite like that, and it certainly wasn't like that in every field, um, but, but there, is a, there is then a shift uh, starting in the 1970s, um, and, and that I think uh, clinicians and scientists are very aware of now, where th there's a lot of pressure for what are often called kind of translational uh, products. Um, there's, there's a lot of sense that the public is, is funding the work and uh, that ultimately we all need to, to benefit from it. And so, so that then perhaps tends to, 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 to mean that saying we're going to work on human embryos uh, or, or, or human cells and not mouse ones, uh, that, that becomes a much more appealing argument to make. Maybe yeah, it's I a really can... interesting point you make, probably especially at the moment, whereas what can you do about COVID? Off you go, you know, here's some money. Emma, can you yeah. give us a bit of a wider context on that? How does this fit in with, for example, sort of stem cells and other research? Are you competing with those people? How easy a sell is it to go off and get money for this? I think the easy answer to that, it's not easy to go and get money for any research project. And the fraction of research projects that are funded is very tiny of those that are submitted. But I just wanted to come back briefly to Nick's point, which I think is a really interesting one, about the switch between mouse or animal models and human models and the flip-flop backwards and forwards. And just to make the point, I emphasized in my presentation that recently in my lab, we switched from a lot of mouse work to a lot of human work. And one reason for that is that the more we dig into the human, the more we realize that subtle differences in how genes are wired up could have a big difference if we're developing pharmaceuticals in the future. But the other important point to make is that we haven't thrown the animal models away and we can't throw the animal models away because that's the only way we have of looking in context of the whole body. So what's the lung doing in the context of the whole animal rather than a few cells growing in a ball of matrix in a dish? And both aspects are very, very important.
So in your lab, are you still doing are you still doing mouse work? You're still going between the, the two systems? So this is a great question and it comes down to funding. And we're not doing as much mouse work as I would like to, because it's very hard to raise the money to do both the mouse work and the human work, both of which are very expensive. But we're still doing some mouse work and we still have a human system going. Yes. So it's really important to side by side. Actually, as we get into studying human regeneration and human diseases and all the details we can now get from our cells in the dish, how do we model that in an animal model before we go into a patient is a really crucial question that I think a lot of us are struggling with. So one approach we're taking in my lab is to put the human cells back into an animal and ask, can we study them in the context of the animal's lung? Is that the right approach? I don't know. And there are other complementary approaches, all of which we need at the moment to try and figure that out. So, so Emma, in a nutshell, I guess, you need two-dimensional in a Petri dish, you need three-dimensional organoids, you need animals to build up the full picture. You can't do without one or the other, you're saying. Exactly. So when you talk about competing research for stem cell technology versus organoids versus animal work, ideally, we fund all of those people to work together jointly to bring, um, bring projects forward towards um, translational medicine. Karosh, how do you how do you guarantee that this doesn't get kind of overhyped? You don't want to overpromise, but you also want to make people who've got money, presumably, think that there is something in it that could be a long term kind of benefit. So how do you get that balance between, you know, being realistic about what you can achieve, but saying, look, in the end, it could save the NHS all of this money with fewer operations and all sorts of things? Absolutely, that's right. And actually, every time that we plan a project, we actually try and plan it quite far in advance. Um, to really think about what the impact um, could be. Because of the, um, of the limitations, uh, we are naturally um, required to focus on, on research that uh, is perhaps more translational. And it's important to really uh, publicize and communicate um, um, new discoveries, right? Um, but perhaps uh, maybe as a scientific committee, we've been uh, slightly guilty of perhaps overhyping uh, some of our discoveries in the past. And, um, you know, that perhaps has resulted in some level of skepticism from, from the public, right? Uh, in that, you know, things that, uh, you know, the scientific community have promised that perhaps have not materialized. I think there is a danger with that, right? Because there's a, um, if the public lose faith in what uh, we are able to do and what we hope to do, I think that that, that would be a bad one. So we need to be um, guarded with our enthusiasm uh, but one of the things that I find um, useful in when we communicate this disease is to really describe uh, the process as I tried to do here in that actually, okay, we've got this discovery. Actually, what does it take to really give it to, to the patients, right? What are, the, what are the other aspects that need to happen? Because sometimes the sort of uh, the communication is such that somebody assumes, okay, this, is, this paper has been published patients may be able to be treated tomorrow. The truth is that actually it's years down the line. So it's about um, communicating the, the science accurately and uh, being enthusiastic about it, but really setting out perhaps what the development pathway looks like in order to um, manage expectations, but also be able to do long-term planning for uh, the ongoing funding that's required for those uh, projects. Nick, is there a history of like overhyped things that sort of didn't come off or did ultimately? There's a, there's a, there's a long and rich history, yes. <laughs> um, and and uh, in, in different scientific fields, I think practitioners have different cautionary tales in, in mind. Um, I think in the stem cell field, where which certainly hasn't been short of hype, um, uh, some good work has been done uh, partly by the International Society for Stem Cell Research to, to try to foster good community standards. I mean, around precise use of language and, and so on. I mean, I'm not saying there's not more that could be done, but that is one, that is one thing that can be quite helpful. And I think also maybe when um, uh, you're, you're writing or being asked to check press releases, um, you, you want something eye-catching, obviously, because you need to attract that funding. You need to make it seem worthwhile. But um, you know, the the, the mini brain uh, issue is an example there. Yeah, that that was in the press release from the from the institute. Miniature brains was in the news and views uh, comment piece in Nature. Um, so it wasn't just being invented by by by, by journalists. But but you know, of course, they're not 
exactly um, thinking, feeling uh, brains. And, and that, that terminology can also plug into um, not just interesting philosophical thought experiments, but some, some actually quite dystopian science fiction. Um, so, so yeah, so I think being careful about that is something that, that, that maybe, may, maybe can, can, can help. Emma, I just wanted to bring us quickly into the here and now, because one thing you said, I bet a lot of people watching would like to know a bit more about your work with COVID, because obviously we think of it as very, I know it damages lots of organs, but, but a, a lung disease. You've said you've already, you know, looked at how it potentially affects sort of cells in children. Could you expand a little bit on what you found and what potentially you could look at in the future that would really help fight with long COVID? No, I'm very happy to. So Obviously, we all know that COVID is a respiratory tract infection. Probably initially affects the upper airways and goes down to, and if you get a very bad case, really trashes your lungs, which is why so many people are on oxygen in hospital at the moment. So what's been really exciting about the COVID period is the number of people who have taken the stem cells, the organoids they have growing in the lab and said, can we help? So we've done a little bit with our pediatric cells and we found that our pediatric and our children's cells that we grow are really very hard to infect with COVID. But I have other colleagues who are working on adult lung stem cells as organoid and they infect beautifully and are killed, really ultimately killed by the cells. So now you have some really fantastic models for asking how does the process of infection work and can we find drugs that disrupt it? So just as an illustration of what's going on here and now, so there are labs doing whole genome-wide screens set for every single gene in the human body in a two-dimensional cell line to say, what genes stop my cells being infected with COVID? Or what drugs can I put on the cells to stop them being infected with COVID? So the idea being they could catch somebody at a very early stage of the disease and stop it progressing. But then the concept of people that work on the organoids is great. So can we take what you learn from these cell line studies and test those drugs in a better model which would be the adult organoid cells before we try them in the patients. So this is a sort of exciting work that's been doing and um, it's really going on at the moment as we speak. So you, in a basic way do you get more accurate answers if you test it on three dimensions of cell than two dimensions? Basically yes. <laughs> so <laughs> what we really found in the last sort of 10 years or so as soon as you go the cells in two dimensions they become this generic cell type and they lose all context of the organ that they came from. If you can maintain their three-dimensional organization, then they maintain their organ identity. So now you're growing lung cells rather than genetic cells. And it's much more interesting to infect lung cells with COVID than it is some generic skull line or a skin cell, which wouldn't normally be infected. Rosh, I'll, I'll leave the final sort of um, question for you. Where, where do you see this being in 10, 15, 20 years time? Paint a picture of how potentially you are using this if you're still going in your career you haven't retired by them but there, or other people are you know in practical ways that will benefit us all yeah thank you well i think um um while um you know true uh, regeneration replacement of organs is uh, some way in the distance i think what one of the things that we will see more and more in the near future is where we are able to use um uh, organoids to, for uh, studying disease processes and for testing the safety and effectiveness of drugs. Because one of the nice things about that is that actually you don't necessarily need a, a complex three-dimensional um, um, structure uh, to be able to, for example, test whether a drug is likely to be effective or not. So that's probably one of the earlier uh, benefits that I think a society will derive from this type of work. And actually we're already seeing evidence of that where cells are uh, being used to test and discover new, new drugs. I think that's probably will come first. The next, uh, the next stage is probably whereby we can use cells uh, for um, uh, treatment of diseases where a complex three-dimensional structure is not required. And probably one of the key um, uh, diseases here is going to be probably diabetes, whereby uh, there's now good evidence that to some extent we are able to generate cells that are able to produce insulin. And actually, once we've shown that these cells are safe, then actually that may be probably a next milestone in terms of using these cells after injection to, um, uh, to be able to treat a condition such as uh, diabetes. There are still lots of problems to be solved, to solve relating to um, the safety of these cells, but also the immune response, as you said.
you know, are we going to be uh, in a place in 10 to 20 years time where, where we are doing a significant number of clinical trials in small numbers of patients in control conditions to test the effectiveness of bioengineered tissue? I believe we will be able to, but in a limited case. And I want to really, again, make the distinction between doing a clinical trial in a small number of patients under very controlled conditions, and then really moving away from that, whereby you've got a treatment that is widely available to most patients uh, uh, in, in the society. My, my feeling is that sort of tissue engineering as a um, routine treatment is probably at least uh, 10 or 20 years away. But hopefully there are these milestones that are described along the way that will actually ensure that this, this science delivers earlier uh, benefits to us all. Nick, Emma, Karosh, thank you so much for your time today. It's a fascinating subject. I'm looking forward to coming in and filming you in the future when COVID is not such a big story and following this through the next few years. Thank you everyone for watching and we hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.